Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, today's video is about the black hole. And in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, how you would interpret a very large object as a black hole or just as a very large object. Well, let's talk about it from a relativistic point because that's uh, where it comes from. It's a mathematical uh, uh, derivation of the uh, Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity. But here's a definition from Wikipedia. A black hole is a region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing, no particles, not even electromagnetic radiation, such as light, can escape from it. The theory of general relativity predicts that a sufficiently compact mass can deform space-time to form a black hole. But this has a thing called a singular singularity. And I don't know if you any of you remember, there used to be a phrase that scientists and people used that said nature abhors a similar a singularity. Let's, this is about the singularity. At the center of the black hole, as described by General Vick, may lie. Now they're hedging their bet a little bit, but then they go on anyway, may, may lie a gravitational singularity, a region where the space-time cur curvature becomes infinite. That means the depth of this hole is infinite. For non-rotating black holes, this region takes the sh shape of a single point, and for a rotating black hole, it is smeared out to form a ring singularity that lies in the plane of rotation. In both cases, the singular region has zero volume. It can also be shown that the singular re contains all the mass of the black hole solution. Not all, the not all the mass of the black hole, but of the solution to these equations. Uh, the singular region can thus be thought of as having infinite density. Single point, zero volume, infinite density. That's why everybody has difficulty understanding why this thing, this situation in space-time could actually happen. It just doesn't make sense, and a singularity is not something that science normally even likes. Well, there's a thing about black holes called the Schwarzschild radius. The radius is, is, is right here uh, from the, the, the singularity out to the event horizon. And Schwarzschild developed this equation. Uh, the, it's the, this radius is sometimes referred to as the gravitational radius. It's a physical parameter physical, this is physical, that shows up in the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein's field equation, corresponding to the radius defining the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole. Now, here's a very interesting statement. It's a characteristic radius, radius associated with every quantity of mass. Ah, I have a mass. I wonder what my Schwarzschild radius is. Well, I calculated it using this one. 80 kilograms, 6.67 .6 times 10 to the minus 11th for G. And C squared is 3 times 10 to the 8th. you got to square that. My Schwarzschild radius ends up being 1.2 times uh, 10 to the minus 25th. I don't even know that that makes sense. I'm not sure that that's, this is something they really intended to say, but a characteristic associated with every quantity of mass. 
Uh, some statements may just don't make sense. Now here's another picture of space-time bending. And this is the point which has zero volume, infinite mass, bending this such that it goes down presumably to infinity. Uh, doesn't really indicate that, but there's the point. Okay, so now the question is, uh, uh, some people are what are called black hole hunters. Andrea Gez. Uh, this is one of her videos. There's many of them out there. I, I couldn't get a good uh, URL here, uh, but if you Google black hole hunter with her name, you'll, you'll find a number of these, including this one. This is a short three-minute video where she... Uh, got a hold of a uh, telescope in Hawaii and took pictures of stars at the center of the galaxy. And uh, she took them once a year, one picture a year, over any many number of years, and tracked the path. If you watch the video, you'll actually see this one moving up as she pu puts these together as a film. And, and all of these other ones are, are there. And she concludes because there is no nothing there that uh, the thing that's that's making these things go around the way they're going is that there must be there just has to be a black hole uh, in the uh, somewhere in there. Uh, presumably, you could figure out where it is. Uh, uh, maybe up in here, you you kind of want a balance of all these things uh, as to where that thing is. Well, she also states in their video that the speed of these stars at the center of the galaxy is 10 million miles per hour. I calculated it as 4,469.4 kilometers per second. That's fast. Now, the chart I have here is really about all the other stars in our galaxy. And this is a typical graph I've used to when I talk about dark matter. In fact, I have a video on dark matter. Uh, and But the peak here, uh, though I don't know, you could uh, argue what this is, is a little bit higher. The peak here, at what I say, this is the center of the core of our galaxy. This is the edge of the core. And then you have a gap and an arm and a gap and an arm and so on. It's only about 260 kilometers per second. But she's looking down here. Okay, maybe maybe there's something else going down here that people didn't get and recorded. Uh, clearly, it, it, it should go faster. Why here? The reason I think it goes slower here is because you're actually measuring... Uh, well, that's the speed of the stars orbiting. Uh, yeah, no, see, there's a, there's a problem there. Uh, you, it should be going faster and faster, and these are shown going down. Which one's wrong? I don't know, but they certainly don't agree. Now, there's something else out there called galaxy clusters. Most galaxies are not alone in the vast expanse of space, but are connected to one or more other galaxies by gravity. The same force that holds you on the Earth can keep many individual galaxies bound together. Groups can be small, such as two galaxies orbiting each other, or large, like the rich Kuma cluster. <laughs> Interesting side note, when I was a part-time driver in California for Enterprise, I worked with a gentleman a, uh, from, the, uh, from the islands, uh, dark skin, beautiful accent, his name was Kuma, and he spelled it this way. His parents named him after this cluster, Kuma. Remember him, nice gentleman. But uh, orbiting each other, or like rich Kuma clusters of thousands of galaxies extending for more than 10 million light years. These are the largest options, objects in the known universe, and they have many properties that make them great astrophysical laboratories. Study them often. Galaxy clusters. So what is the force? The force of gravity that holds clusters together comes mostly from dark matter, making clusters an excellent way to study dark matter in the universe. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Andrea Gez, 
she concludes it's a black hole in the center of our galaxy, but in the center of, because there's nothing there. And then we look at these clusters and there's nothing there either, and, but now it's dark matter. The, one of the interesting things about the way they talk about dark matter is they'll take a spiral galaxy, add dark matter, and, and that dark matter makes it a sphere, and the galaxy becomes just almost disappears, and they assume the dark matter and the mass of the galaxy are a point mass. Is it a black hole? Is it dark matter? It's a... Uh, well, you can't see either one of them. So you, you look at a space, you don't see it. You've got to decide whether it's a black hole or dark matter. My question is, what about the Berry Center? Well, if I, you haven't heard about the Berry Center, let me explain. There is considered a, a point of balance between the Earth and the Moon called the Berry Center, and that's represented by this plus sign, that's where the very center is, and it's actually inside the Earth. And the Earth, the center of gravity of the Earth, which is here, going around here like this, is, symbol, is shown by this red circle. Uh, that's the uh, it's way it's circulating around the very center, and this is shown as the circle going around that very center as well. The very center is if you could put the Earth and the Moon on a long balance and put try to find its pivot point as to where the Earth on one side and the Moon on the other side balance, that's the point. It's a, it's a uh, gravity balance point. Now these are so, these are moving around each other. Maybe shouldn't there be a black hole or dark matter here? No, no, they're happy with Berry Center when it comes to this one, and and it it, it makes sense. Interesting point, however, the the uh, plus sign, the this Berry Center, more than likely is orbiting the Sun in an elliptical path, while the Earth and Moon are doing a dance around the Sun. It's uh, it, they have pictures of this or graphics of this on the internet. It's very interesting to look at. Well, it was a year more than it was it maybe more than a year ago we saw in the news that they, uh, they actually got a picture of a black hole, and, and uh, they're saying that this light was blocked by a black hole. Uh, I don't know whether anybody was convinced by it, but as far as I'm concerned, that could just as well have been a, uh, a another object. What you really needed to see is a sequence of pictures showing uh, what's going on, and maybe you'd get a better idea. Of course, maybe out here you can't see it. Here you can. Almost makes it look like a an eclipse. Black hole, dark matter. Well, not dark matter, but maybe just a very large object. Okay, let's talk about what a TPM black hole might be. Could there be a very large object? Not a hole, okay? I'm not really suggesting that there's a hole, a black hole here, just a very large object that is defined by the principle stated in the particle model. If you're going to have a black hole, it has to absorb all matter, all light. So there needs to be a very strong G1 gravity around this large object where G1 gravity pushes objects towards this very large object, pushing other objects towards it. And there needs to be a very strong G2 gravity around this large object that pushes light towards the very large object. So now if you had a large object with a strong enough gravi <coughs> gravity, then you then you you have the one of the primary characteristics of a black hole, a TP, in this case a TPM black hole. Well, let's take a look look at it. And a normal gravity from small to large objects, you have a number of of uh, G one particles coming in here, and here is the same number. That's true all the way around. 
and you lose part of them here and another part here. And so this is how many you've lost. And this is the net number pushing down. A is the number of G1s entering. A minus 2, small a, is the number lost when the G1 passes through the object. And for a very small object, you can have a very, a very a little gravity, nearly zero. For a very large object, it could get as high as a. And so it could range over that for a normal object. This is the way I normally talk about how gravity develops at the surface of the Earth, and that's true all the way around. Well, let's say you now have a larger object, and the the loss is gets to the point where it's zero. By the time it gets there, it's so large or it's so dense that it, it's zero. And so you reach a point where the value here, the net value is A. When the size and density is right, all the G1s are lost. The value of gravity has reached its maximum. TPM would indicate that there is a maximum value of gravity. The value is based on the G1 particle density. The G1 particle, how many per cubic meter are here or cubic centimeter are here. Uh, part of density that assumed to be there in an infinite universe. In other words, you might expect that gravity is essentially the same all the way around the universe. That requires the universe to be infinite, to, to be that way. You can't have a large uh, open space and a, a small group of, of mass because there would be nothing coming in from nothing out there and so <clears throat> that's why we tend to think at the particle model, space is infinite, the mass is almost infinite, and therefore this uh, particle density is the same all the way through the universe. Okay, so let's go to an extra large object. The extra large object loses all of its G1 before it even reaches the center. The, the last one we talked about was this big. Now we got one this big. It reaches zero before it gets to the center, and that's true from this direction. There is a sphere in the center that contains no G1s. The value of the gravity, even though this is that much bigger, is still only A, because that's how all you that's all you have here in the G1 particle field. Uh, you don't automatically have more somehow. Uh, now, this is kind of interesting. Here you are, if you could even be here in the center of this object, you'd be weightless because there's no G1s. But even in outer space, out, if this was outer space now, uh, you have zero gravity, but you've got the same number. you got all these uh, G1s hitting you. Uh, that's because they're equal and opposite. Here they're equal and opposite. No singularity. This is not a point of infinite mass. Uh, it, it, if this object even exists, this big and with this amount of gravity, uh, it, uh, it's not clear it would even survive as that object. It may morph into something else. I'm not an expert in that area. I'm just saying if it got that large and if it, if it lost this much before it got to the center, you, you'd have this area which is still mass. This is still mass and there is no singularity in the TPM model for a black hole. So what is the maximum? Well, there are two virtual constants in the TPM equation for gravity. It's one I developed uh, F sub P and I sub F. F sub P is the potential force of gravity at any point in space. It is related to the density of the G1 particle field. The universe needs to be infinite for the G1 field to be uniform all over space. Maybe uh, locally, the G1 particle field isn't necessarily equal inside our galaxy. It's not the same as outside because the mass changes it. But in general, <coughs> this force is a general force is related to the 
density of the G1 particle field. I sub f is the percent interaction factor with the G1 of the G1 with the object. So uh, how, how fast do you lose the G1s as they pass through is related to this percent. I actually calculated, uh, I, I completed the calculation early 2015 uh, for two different uh, experiments that were done by Majorana. I have numbers that boggle my mind. I have re <coughs> not published these numbers, and I won't because they need to be verified. Uh, I have little confidence in them. But if these values were known, TPM could predict the maximum value of gravity. Interesting thing to predict. OK, conclusion. The black hole, black hole predicted by relativity is rejected by TPM. There is no object of zero volume, maximum density, and there is no singularity. TPM asserts that there could be large objects that have a very strong G1 and G2 gravity that could be labeled TPM black hole, but are just very large objects. But then the question is, would the maximum value of G1 gravity be able to absorb all matter? Would the value of G2 absorb all light? Questions that I can't answer. And, uh, and uh, it will, if the model goes on after I'm gone, maybe someone will be figuring all this out. My name is Bob DeHilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time. We'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.